to record. So you're very welcome here today to this session that is on um, biodiversity for community spaces, which is brought to you by the Irish Community Archive Network, which is a national museum initiative, which works in partnership with our county heritage officers in Clare, May uh, Clare Galway and Wicklow to support community groups to digitize their local history and heritage and share it online. And I suppose this talk was originally conceived as part of the training program for these community groups, but we felt, wouldn't it be a wonderful idea to open it up to a wider audience uh, as part of National Biodiversity Week. And actually, I think it's International Biodiversity Day today. So uh, no better time for us to have the talk. So we hope you enjoy it. And I would just like to thank and acknowledge um, Conjella Maguire, the County Clare Heritage Officer, for actually sponsoring this event for the Irish Community Archive Network. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our speaker today. Uh, thank you very much, Janice Fuller. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Lorna. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. Um, let's hope this time next year we'll all be meeting in person somewhere and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get there eventually, but it's really nice to be with you here today. And as, as Lorna said, it's National or International Biodiversity Day. So it's nice to have the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, um, biodiversity and uh, communities. So I just share my screen. And just while I'm doing that, um, just, I think most of you are on mute, um, but just maybe just if it would be easier just for sound, if you could stay on mute during the talk. We'll have time at the end for questions. It'd probably be easier just to do those questions at the end. But if you think of a question and you're afraid you might forget it, just pop it in the chat and then Lorna will read them out at the end or you can, you can read them out yourselves. So I just go into presentation mode, there we go. Hopefully the sun is shining where you are. It's lovely and, and uh, sunny here in Galway today. Um, oh, there we go. Brilliant. Can everybody see that? Yeah, Lorna's nodding, so that's great. <laughs> okay, and I suppose, you know, just re referring to the whole COVID crisis, you know, I suppose one of the things that came out of it is that, that many people found great solace in nature and wildlife and the sort of natural and wild spaces in and around where they live. And I think now is a really good opportunity to maybe reimagine our towns and villages and community, community spaces and think maybe how they could be a bit greener and wilder for the benefit of nature and wildlife. And of course, for ourselves and for our communities. And I suppose I'm going to present a few ideas and um, examples of, of biodiversity and community spaces. There's no kind of rocket science here. This is all very simple, straightforward stuff that basically anybody can, can do. So, I mean, the idea, as I said, is, is kind of biodiversity in community spaces. And there's loads of things that we can all do to, to really make a difference and have a positive impact on nature and wildlife in our community spaces. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a botanist and an ecologist. And that's the kind of the day job. I work as an ecologist, but I've also worked over the years with many community groups on biodiversity projects. And I'll present some of the, the sort of projects I've seen around the country today. Um, and I'm also a national tiny towns adjudicator, which is something that I absolutely love. And I feel very privileged to get to go around and see what tiny towns groups are doing around the country and I'm always completely blown away by the, the commitment of um, Tidy Towns groups and other community groups that are working hard for the benefit of their community and um, the environment. So as I said, the ideas I, I'm going to present today are things that you can do in community spaces, in towns and villages to enhance nature and wildlife for the benefit of, of biodiversity, but also for the benefit of, of ourselves, and our communities. I, as I said, I, I, you know, I, I can't stop talking about tidy towns because I'm so passionate about it. But, you know, for those of you who aren't in tidy towns, just to say, I mean, the ethos of tidy towns is all about um, community spirit. And it, I really think the tidy towns movement helps build vibrant um, communities. And there's a huge focus in the competition on kind of working together and caring for the, the environment and for the, the natural world. The, the competition has evolved a lot in, in recent years. It's very progressive and really kind of 
keeps in touch with, with new developments and people who are involved in the competition, particularly this year, will see that all the categories are linked with the, the global sustainable development goals, which includes, you know, climate action, sustainability, protecting diversity, including all sorts of other things about tackling poverty and, you know, um, well-being and all those sorts of things. So it's a very progressive. But even if you're not in a tidy trans group, there's loads of things you can do um, in your community or with your whatever community group you're involved in. And in Ireland, I suppose we're, we're, you know, I don't know if this is the same in other countries, but I'm always struck at how much kind of community action there is out there, whether it is tidy towns, residence groups, you know, GIY groups. I'm in a GIY, I grow it your, yourself group, which I really love. Men's sheds, you know, there's, there's loads of opportunities. So if you're not in a community group, you know, there's loads of potential to get involved. Obviously, the whole pandemic, you know, but yeah, stopped a lot of community activity, but hopefully moving forward, we can get back involved with our um, community. So there's huge potential to get involved and do things that benefit, as I said, the biodiversity and the environment, but also are good for ourselves and our, our communities. I suppose if we're talking about biodiversity, you know, it's good to just stop and think what biodiversity is. And you're probably all very familiar with, with the term, but it's really just another word for nature and, and wildlife and natural heritage, all that sort of thing. And it includes all the different, you know, animals and plants and fungi, all living things. But it also includes the places where plants and animals live, the habitats, and the sort of all those interactions among living things, kind of food webs and food chains and all that sort of stuff. Um, the emphasis in, in the word is on diversity and the importance of diversity. We can't afford, we've lost a lot of species in recent years and we can't really afford to lose more because every species has a role. And as I said, all those kind of interactions are very important. So we really need to protect that, that um, diversity. And I suppose when we think about biodiversity, sometimes we think it's a bit sort of a highfalutin concept or biodiversity is somewhere else, you know, but biodiversity is all around us and everywhere. It's in our gardens, it's in our towns and villages, it's probably in our kitchen sink if there's, you know, crumbs and, and, and um, bacteria or anything. It's, it's absolutely everywhere and all around us. And, and, uh, and there's potential to kind of protect and enhance biodiversity on our doorsteps and as I said, everywhere we are and, and, and live and, and interact, which is great. So, you know, we don't want to go too much doom and gloom, but, you know, the reality is that we're in a situation at the minute where there's climate breakdown and linked to that, you know, we have a kind of a global biodiversity crisis. But I suppose the take home message that I would have is that there's something that we can all do and what that can really make a positive and a real difference. And you know that that phrase, think global, act local. There's loads of things that we can do locally. Many things that are very simple to do have no cost, you know, that can really make a difference. And there's huge potential when we come together as communities um, to, to, for, for real um, change. Obviously, we need to do things at all, all sectors, you know, but Today, the focus is on communities and what we can do our, ourselves. So for thinking about biodiversity in community spaces or in towns or villages, you know, what, what kind of places are we thinking about, you know, and sometimes people, you know, come to me and say, well, we, you know, if they live in a, in a big urban area or they, they're even in a small village, they can't really see where, where biodiversity is. They think of biodiversity often the burn or in Connemara or sort of really wild places. But as I said, biodiversity is everywhere, you know, even in large urban areas, whether it's bits of road verges, you know, roundabouts, any sort of green space, park or sports ground, even old church grounds. Um, there's just you know, even the smallest space can have some living things and, and biodiversity. So there's loads of potential where we can do things to either protect existing biodiversity or to manage it better or to enhance it. And I suppose one thing we have to do, particularly in urban areas or in our, is to sort of move away from sort of over manicuring spaces, you know, and maybe embrace a sort of a wilder aesthetic, you know, and leaving things sort of grow a little bit, maybe a little bit messier looking, but maybe look at it 
you know, a little bit differently and sort of embrace that. Um, and certainly the Tidy Towns competition has really done that. You know, in the past, it was all about sort of making things very beautiful and very tidy and neat, whereas now we're really embracing the value of those wilder spaces. And I think a lot of Tidy Towns groups have particularly, you know, um, made great progress in sort of enhancing those wilder spots in their areas. So there's loads of potential, I suppose that's, that's the point. Um, and the advantages of sort of thinking about things in a sort of more sort of a wild or more biodiverse way, you know, in many cases, and I'll show you a few examples, it's much more cost effective. Even if we're going a bit wild and a bit more natural, it can be really beautiful and attractive. There's been, you know, demonstrated, um, I suppose, particularly during the COVID crisis, but there's loads of um, research projects that show the health benefits of that connection with nature, having even a view out your window, you know, or a, a, a space that you can walk, a tree in your garden, anything that helps you connect with, with nature um, can give you health um, benefits. Obviously, if you protect the natural environment, that's there's environmental benefits. And in many cases, the approach of when you're sort of working with biodiversity, it can be more sustainable. And again, I'll show you some real examples um, in a minute. And I think it's really important, I suppose, you know, as I said, the last year, we've really valued any place that we can walk, that we can sit, that we can reflect, that we can spend time where there is a bit of biodiversity and nature, you know. So I think the more we can bring that into our urban spaces, it's not just about the, the countryside, it's having those spaces in our urban areas is, is really, really important. So I'm just going to go through a few examples of things that we can do in our community spaces. Of course, these are things that we can apply anywhere, you know, in our work places, in our own um, homes and gardens and land, you know, but I just kind of focus on community. But th these are things that you can do absolutely anywhere. So I suppose the first thing I'd suggest um, if you're sort of starting off as a community group or if you're if you're thinking of what what to do in your area is to kind of look around and see what's already there. Sometimes people are mad keen to do things, you know, but it's always good to stop and have a good look and see what's there. And many groups would start off by kind of drawing a map of their area, get a few colouring pencils out and sort of mark, you know, where are the sports grounds? Where are the... The, the rivers, you know, where is there maybe a group of trees, where are there parks or wilder spaces or things, you know, places that are, are nice now and maybe have a biodiversity value or maybe eyesores or, you know, sort of waste ground places that aren't so attractive or that there's potential to do something, but really to, to look at your area and see what's there, areas that to protect or enhance or, or manage. Some of them might, might look too nice, you know, they might be a big old bramble patch that um, you know, might, you might think isn't great, but actually could be massively important for birds and for, for insects. So sometimes it's sort of, you know, sort of reimagining those places or, or, or thinking of them in, in a different way. You know, as I said, it could be urban, urban areas where there's a bit of planting. It could be nice rivers or canals. It could be a dirty old looking stream or ditch that maybe isn't so attractive now, but maybe it could be enhanced by taking out a bit of rubbish or, or protecting it in some way. It could be in the smallest little planters, you know, it could be all sorts of, of spaces, but to just see what you already have that you could maybe um, do something with. And I particularly fond of old, um, church grounds and graveyards, they can be lovely places to kind of, they're obviously hugely important community spaces and family spaces, but they can also be nice quiet places for reflection and um, and often because of the, just their, their nature that they've been there for a long time, they can be hugely important for biodiversity as well, old trees or, or flowers and, and bits of grassland. Just another thing you can do as well when you're just at the planning phase, just thinking about what you might do, is, is try and see, are there any areas that are designated for nature conservation in your area? And there's a really good um, website, you probably looked at it already, um, heritagemaps.ie. There's loads of websites, to be honest, I could you know, list them all out, but this is just one I think is particularly useful because it pulls all that information together. You can find your area on it and you can see there's loads of layers of information that you can see, including areas that are designated for 
nature conservation, as well as national monuments and protected structures and all sorts of stuff. But that's a good way of seeing. In this case, you can see there's sort of a red line through the, the aerial photo, and that's a special area of conservation. And you know, that means you've got something really special in your area. Sometimes people look at these as a negative and they think, oh darn, we can't do things, you know, there's, there's all sorts of regulation. But I always like to turn these things on their head and think this is a really positive, this is a, a really special place, and aren't we lucky to have it on our doorstep? I'd always suggest contacting your local heritage officer as well. And we're very lucky in, in, in the West with some fantastic um, heritage officers, such as Congella that Lorna mentioned earlier in Clare. Um, but there's often local experts or people that you can chat to as well. And the heritage officer might be able to point you in the right um, direction. This is just showing that same river on um, heritage maps .ie. Now you can't really necessarily see all the, the symbols and all the rest of it, but there's all these different layers on that uh, website that you can have great fun clicking on and off and seeing what's in your, your area, which is great. I suppose there's, the, you know, one thing that, that there's great potential for in urban areas, and I suppose tidy towns are particularly interested, in, but lots of groups are interested in sort of landscaping. Many towns and villages have some for, so form of, of landscaping, whether it's planters or flower beds or, trees or you know bits of grassland so there's huge potential here to to manage these in an air in a way that's 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 wildlife friendly as well so whether as i said it's flower beds or, or bigger spaces greens and all the rest of it and i suppose one key thing that i would say that maybe some of you are doing already but we really need to move away from buying loads and loads of summer bedding you know there's a huge cost involved it only lasts for weeks you know, you've got to think of all the compost, all the plastic for the, 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 you know, the pots and all the rest of it that's involved for maybe six weeks of flowers, you know. Now, you know, we all like a bit of summer bedding. It's not that you can't have summer bedding, but it's not to rely on summer bedding for all of your, your flowers in towns and villages or in your gardens, you know. And particularly some of that summer bedding, you know, has absolutely no value for, um, for wildlife or for pollinators. So I'm thinking things with double flowers or some of those, those um, highly bred begonias and things. We really need to move away from that. So that's one kind of thing I would really encourage you to do. And I'll show you that there's lots of alternatives. And as I said, if you really want that splash of color, it's not that you can't buy it, but just not to rely on it. And one really positive development in recent years that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of is the All Ireland pollinator plan and there's absolutely fantastic guidance in the plan for particularly for community groups and there's there's booklets just for community groups there's all sorts of how to guides pollinator plant codes all sorts of information in there and you can download them very easily or if you can't download them you know you could talk nicely to your heritage officer and they might have a hard copy they could send you out but I suppose the key thing about the pollinator plan is what's good for pollinators is good for wildlife in general. So it's actually like a biodiversity plan. Everything in that plan is good for, for other wildlife as well as, by, as pollinators and also good for the environment. So it ticks loads of boxes, um, which is absolutely fantastic. So if you haven't, if you're not aware of it or if you haven't looked at some of that guidance, um, I would really encourage you to do so. Sometimes it's a little overwhelming because the lists are so long, you know, but hopefully you, you can kind of get, you could bring some of that information to your local garden centre and say, look, you know, these are the things that, are, that, are, that it's encouraging me to plant. Can you tell me what will grow in where I live or in our town or village? And you might get, you know, good advice there. I mean, the advantage of pollinator or wildlife friendly gardening is that it can look absolutely fab. I mean, the great thing, bees like colorful, showy flowers. We like the same kind of flowers. We like a bit of color in our landscaping as well. So, you know, you're not sacrificing sort of having beautiful spaces. You know, pollinator and wildlife friendly gardening can look absolutely gorgeous. As I said, it's good for wildlife, good for the environment because a lot of the plants that you will use in pollinator friendly planting is are, are perennial, so they'll come back every year. So you're not getting loads and loads of compost and buying plants every year and all the plastic and the transport that's involved. So it's good for the environment, more sustainable, more cost effective, because as I said, you're not 
you're not relying on your summer bedding as much your costs I guarantee you your costs will go down over time and I know that from talking to tidy towns groups that the budget they were spending on summer bedding you know there's an initial cost of um buying the sort of perennial plants but their planting cost goes goes down dramatically so it, there's win-win on all counts there when you go for a pollinator friendly approach and really all you have to do is include more perennials in your your planting doesn't mean you can't put in maybe a few of those showy annuals and I've done it myself I've just planted some planters in my garden and I can't resist a few annuals and um, but I also have the perennials you know and you know you might need to do a little bit more management clip down the the the, the dead heads and and the, the the perennial plants at the end of the season but they'll come back and reward you every year and some of those perennials will keep flowering will keep coming back for about 10 to 12 years which is absolutely fantastic so your your initial cost of a couple of euro and then it just keeps on giving which is brilliant the other thing I would suggest is to kind of go for more naturalistic planting, you know, less maybe of those formal sort of lines and rows, go for more naturalistic. Think about structure, you know, so that you have tall things and bushy things and small things, you know, and the bees and, and wildlife in general, you know, they're often a bit sort of shy, you know, and they, they or they, they, they need that bit of shelter as well. So they like that bit of structure, you know, and if you have a mix of planting, you're going it's going to look much better personally i think but also it's going to attract more wildlife and one thing i'd really suggest is try and think of the growing season and have things that are flowering at different times um again just look at your existing landscaping it doesn't mean about throwing everything out look what you already have in your beds or whatever what you're already using maybe I think how can we enhance that I wouldn't you know I wouldn't throw everything out you know you might have some nice shrubs and you might have you know some plants there already maybe they're not massively important for for wildlife but you can enhance it by including more perennials or including a few annuals and some of those annuals can be pollinator um friendly as well you know it's the it's the double flowered you know, highly bred things that really have absolutely no pollen or nectar and they're, they're of no use. But there are, you know, loads of different perennials and, and a few annuals that, that are great for, for, for pollinators. So include those in your scheme. You don't have to do it straight away. It can just be something you do over time. So pick maybe one bed for this year or a couple of planters and, and roll it out slowly over time. Okay. Now there's loads of plants I could I could list off, but they're all on that that um, pollinator.ie website. And as I said, bring the list to your garden center and they can maybe help you with it. I'm a gardener and I absolutely love gardening. It's it just keeps me sane, kept me sane this last year, you know. Um, and you're just really rewarded by, you know, having a beautiful garden or a beautiful green space, but knowing that it's good for wildlife as well is fantastic. This is a beautiful um, biodiversity garden that I came across in Carrick on Shannon that I thought was really lovely. And I really liked that they put a sign up, they highlighted what they were doing and why they're doing. So they're actually spreading the word. They're not just doing something that's good for wildlife, they're sharing it with their, their community. And I suppose what I'd love to see is that in, you know, in future years, we don't even have to put up signage, you know, that we have, that all our flower beds in our urban spaces have something for wildlife, you know, and that are doing something that looks absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I think flowers and urban space, they're really, you know, we need that bit of color, you know, it's, it's great. But, you know, it's great if it ticks lots of boxes as well and does something for wildlife as well. You know, and many of those kind of planting schemes, I should add, you know, can be low maintenance as well, rather than to dig up every year and, you know, replant. It can be something that's that's just lasts and, and keeps on giving, which is, is fantastic. And again, just traveling around the country, you just see so many nice examples. You know, this is up in Westport and, you know, they've been kind of doing this sort of mixed planting for years, you know, um, where you've got lots of different plants grown together that are all adding something different you know whether it's foliage or flowers and you know not everything has to be pollinator friendly or wildlife friendly but you have them in the mix and it can look absolutely fantastic i love it in sort of you know in those real gray hard landscaping it's really nice to have that burst of of color and green i think this is down in in waterford 
this is a, this would be a local authority planting scheme and i should say a lot of county councils and local authorities have signed up to the pollinator plan which is absolutely fantastic and are working with their tidy towns groups again you know it looks a bit sort of you know love lovely color you know that's got the structure i was talking about tall things and short things and bushy things things kind of spilling over looks absolutely fantastic i think and uh, a bit more three-dimensional than some of our traditional kind of summer bedding you know all sort of one type of plant in one um, plane uh, i think this looks absolutely fantastic this is a nice urban planting scheme again and just sort of trying to you know do things that are more natural this is kind of screening a, a, um, a road a, a sort of a bypass type thing you know there's just loads of, of potential there in, in in our community spaces and again just thinking about the norm the, the formal versus the naturalistic you know on i suppose on my top left i don't know what it looks like in your screen we've got the traditional kind of begonias you know they're grand you know they've lovely color they're great but they're really they're not offering anything to the wildlife you know it doesn't mean you can't have them because we all some people really like them and that's absolutely fine it's just to have other beds that have maybe something that's good for wildlife and i just wanted to point you can still have formal planting with perennials you know if that's appropriate to that particular place you know and um, there's the example here there's um a lavender in front of a local authority a building or you can have a box hedging and you can have your perennial flowers so you can have that that formal as well if you want and it can still be wildlife um, friendly as, as i mentioned earlier if it's possible you know aim for flowers as as, as much of the year as, as possible now that, that could be challenging you know um but some things that you mightn't think of can have early flowers like hazel. Hazel is brilliant at that, 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 the shrub, you know, so that might be in hedges or in, in um, parks and all the rest of it. Hawthorn is going bananas at the minute. It's a beautiful blossom, you know, it's good for, for, um, for, for pollinators. And then you can have early flowers, midsummer flowers, late summer flowers, you know, so you can try and look at your planting, you know, um, wherever you are, it, whether it's in a, in a village or in your own garden and try and, and spread spread that, that uh, planting town. Loads of information on pollinator.ie. Lots of tidy towns groups and community groups like to plant planters, you know. What I would say is not to go completely mad and rely too much on them because they, they do require a lot of watering, you know, and hanging baskets and window boxes. They can look fab. I wouldn't overdo it because you know, from a sort of an environmental point of view, they need a lot of water and, and mind be, but in the right place, they can be fantastic. And I've got a couple in my garden, I wouldn't be without them, but I just, you just don't want to have too many of them. But even in small planters, big planters, window boxes, hanging baskets, you can still include things that are good for pollinators and can look absolutely gorgeous. Um, I've just, this is just a couple of examples. I think one is in, I think they're both in Galway actually, but. What I would say, I think they're more appropriate in a community space on hard uh, landscaping. I'd avoid putting planters on um, grass because if you've got grass, you should be planting directly into the grass, into the green, into the earth, if you know what I mean, because it'll be much easier in terms of watering and, and minding, you know. But planters can look fantastic on, on hard landscaping too. They can do all sorts of functions, but they can also be good for, for wildlife and they can kind of break up grey kind of concrete jungles. They can look lovely. This is just a couple of, of um, pollinator friendly annuals. So sometimes, you know, in some spaces, particularly, I suppose, that they hanging um, baskets and window boxes, it's easier to put in annuals. So there are a few that are, are great for for uh, pollinators, I always use Bacopa I, and Bidens, actually both of them, I've always put them in because I think they're lovely and, uh, and they flower for ages, you know, which is great. I'm, I'm really selling the old pollinator friendly flowers, but, you know, if you've got a herb garden, you know, and I've seen that in community spaces where they have community herb gardens and where people can come and pick herbs and bring them home, which I think is a really nice idea. And it can be really nice on kind of a raised bed or something like that. Most of our herbs are, are pollinator friendly, you know, and they can also be nice in a sensory garden. I mean, there's just huge potential there. So um, just another idea. 
I suppose just another thing, um, just moving away from kind of planting for, for wildlife and for pollinators is managing grassland and loads of towns and villages and our own gardens, we have loads of areas of, of grass. And again, this is something you might be familiar with, you know, and there's kind of a couple of options, you know, people are kind of going a bit mad on the, on the, um, the seed bombs and wanting to plant wildflower meadows, you know, personally, I would really kind of steer away from that because um, in many cases you're planting seeds that aren't, they might be native to Ireland, but they might not be native to your local area. There's a huge amount of, of work involved in, the, in planting by seed, whereas it's much easier actually just to manage grassland and much more effective. Um, so I think one of the key things we can do in our kind of parks and sports grounds and school grounds is just it's just mow, is mow the grass less often, you know, where there's a high footfall, you still need to mow, but maybe push out your mowing regime where you're not mowing as often. I mean, I, I have a lawn. I love I love cut grass. I love the look of cut grass. But what I'm doing is I'm just trying to mow a little bit less frequently. The clovers, the buttercups, if you're lucky, the um, cow slips, the cuckoo flowers, if you're on a damper grassland, you know, the veronicas, all these little grassland flowers, you'll notice start to flower. We have to start, start embracing the old dandelion. I used to love mowing dandelions, but now I'm trying to sort of hold back, let them flower and then, then mow them, <laughs> you know. It's just pushing out your mowing regime. It mightn't feel like all that dramatic. It's massive if you think of the amount of grassland that we have you know, in, in and around towns and villages and gardens. So I'd really encourage you to do that. And if you're in tiny towns, just put that in your application and the, the adjudicator will know you're doing that and that you that will really be a positive. Um, this is just a neighbor of mine that is just, they've just pushed it out, you know, so they're mowing again less often and you can just see, you know, um, and it's not that they're not mowing it at all. They're just going to pushing it out, maybe rather than every two weeks, doing it every four weeks and it's full of clovers and um, and all sorts of nice um, with yellow rattle there, all sorts of nice things coming up. It might take a few years that you notice, but you'll notice if you do that over time, you'll get more and more flowers in your grassland. The second thing that you can do, and again, this is maybe more on a local authority level, but you can work with your, your local authority to encourage them is to, you know, leaving road verges or roundabouts or edges in parks and green spaces, leaving areas unmown all summer long. So you don't mow them all summer and you mow them at the end of the year. There's usually places that you can, you can do that. Not, not at a place where there's football being played regularly, but there's usually, I, rec I think we're just mowing too much in general. So it's identifying areas that it's suitable not to, to mow. Um, and what you can do, you know, if you've got a large green space and um, that you can leave on mown, um, you can mow paths through it, which allows people to walk through it. But the key thing is that you do cut the grass at the end of the growing season and remove the clippings. What you're trying to do is over time reduce the fertility of the, the grassland and you'll get more and more flowers. It won't look like the cover of the packet of wildflower seeds that you see in Little or Aldi with loads of poppies and cornflowers, but that's a flower meadow. It's not a wildflower meadow. By creating a sort of a natural wildflower through just mowing or not mowing, you will actually get a much more authentic um, natural native wildflower meadow that will have much more value for pollinators than anything that comes out of a packet. Um, so I'd really encourage you to do that. And a lot of county councils are doing this and working with tidy towns groups. And um, so this is kind of, you know, in the right area and just not mowing all year long and um, mowing at the end of the, the season. This is, is great for pollinators because you have more flowers. It's great for, for wildlife in general. You know, a lot of birds will feed on the grass seeds in those kind of meadowy grasslands. Um, it costs much less, you're not mowing as much, so there's, uh, you're using less um, petrol, you know, there's just huge benefits because there's, you know, much less of a carbon footprint as well, so there's environmental benefits as well. And I've seen around the country, you know, great examples of this. This is down in, in Ennis, where they were kind of one of the early groups sort of trialing, um, not mowing roundabouts and road verges and all the rest of it, and with really great um, results. This is 
a couple of roundabouts. I think they're both in Ennis and uh, in Clare. And really very soon you start seeing, you know, just your ordinary clovers, but actually they're really pretty or the oxide daisies uh, starting to bloom. And over time, if you follow that approach of taking off the grass clippings at the end of the season, when you mow it, you'll get more and more um, flowers there. So it can look very attractive. One of the things that a lot of groups do would be mow the edge of those, these sort of meadows so that, you know, you can see that contrast. And if you put up a sign just to let people know that it isn't that you couldn't be bothered cutting the grass or you're getting lazy, you know, it's that it, you're, you're leaving this area for wildlife and then people are usually happy enough um, about it. This is just an example from Port Leash in the GAA grounds, just where they had loads of land, you know, as well as the pitches. And they just decided to, to they were convinced by the tidy towns not to mow it. And after a couple of seasons, you know, they, they've left a path mown through it so people can walk and enjoy it. And you're, they're getting all their oxide daisies and it looks absolutely fantastic, I think, you know, and I can't emphasize enough how good that is for, for wildlife. You know, all small mammals that are rooting around in there, you know, birds as well as pollinators. So it's very simple and fantastic. This is just back up in Carrick and Shannon again. And again, it might not look absolutely fantastic, but I think there's huge wildlife value there. So this is in a, in a park where they've mowed the edges so it looks nice and neat. It looks well maintained. It looks like somebody really cares about it, but they haven't mown half as much as they usually mow. Um, and they've got lovely meadows there, which is, which is brilliant. And they've put their sign up so that people know this is, this is an area um, managed for, for wildlife. And they've plenty of other areas that they're mowing um, for amenity grassland. So it's not like people can't have places for picnicking or, or um, playing ball. And I just wanted to include this photo. This is, you know, a native, this is what a native wildflower meadow looks like at its best. You know, so there's still a lot of grass. It's still, it's not a sort of flower rich, as, as I said, things that come out of a packet, but massive value for, for um, pollinators and, and wildlife. So moving on from, from grassland, I suppose another very simple thing to do that I'd always encourage community groups and gardeners and anybody to do is to plant planting trees. I mean, it's one of the best things that we can do for wildlife in, in general. But I really think that we, you know, it can enhance urban and community spaces. And I, you know, in general in Ireland, we have very little woodland, particularly native woodland. And I think if you go abroad, you see other urban spaces with way more trees than we do in Ireland. I think we have to learn how to sort of embrace trees in our urban and our, our, our urban spaces and in towns and villages. They can, you know, really add to the kind of concrete jungle. They can really set off a building and make it look really more beautiful. They can hide ugly looking spaces. There's just so many benefits and obviously they're really good for for wildlife, for pollinators, you might not think of that, but a lot of our trees, our native trees, have lovely flowers that are really good for pollinators. They can have fruit or nuts that are good for birds and small mammals. It can be really cheap thing to do. And I'd really encourage you to, you know, plant the cheapest stock that you can, you know, don't go buy in the big tree, go and go to the, the nursery in winter time is probably the best time and buy the smallest, you know, cheapest, bare root stock that you can find, it's much more likely to thrive and to grow well. The big expensive trees that you buy in the nurseries are just, you have to take much more care planting them. And there's much more chance that they won't um, adapt to the to whatever the prevailing wind or whatever. And, you know, just much more harder to, to plant. Um, but great potential in our native trees and shrubs or even other trees can, can add to your, your town and village. Um, as I said, these are all the benefits, you know, birds, pollinators, mammals, you know, on the, on the, in the countryside, they can really contribute to protecting water quality when they're along um, streams and rivers and lakesides. Obviously really important for, for climate, you know, we're going through a period of climate breakdown at, at the minute. Um, and it's something really positive that we can all do is plant a tree because they take up carbon and they hold on to, onto it in the wood. As long as that tree is, is alive, that carbon is locked in, in the wood. And we've huge scope for planting more trees in, um, 
in, on the Irish landscape and in the towns and villages. This is just a shot from, from Nina in Tipperary. And I just think, doesn't it look gorgeous with all those trees? I think it really can break up and enhance and, you know, kind of soften the urban landscape. And I think we've all, you know, in, in towns and villages, you know, might have a favourite tree, might not even notice it. But if you stop and have a look, it, I just really think it can be a positive thing. And it's something we need to, to do more in our, in our urban um, spaces they can help us kind of relax and unwind we have that green in and around our buildings um, and urban environments as I said earlier there's loads of native trees and shrubs that are absolutely beautiful personally I think there's no problem in planting non-natives as well particularly in urban areas you know and in our gardens maybe out in the rural environments I would really go for pure natives but a lot of our natives are really really beautiful the holly, you know, if you have a small garden or a small space, it grows slowly, absolutely beautiful. Um, Gelder rose, which isn't in the rose family, that's the one on the bottom right on my screen with the, with the really glossy berries, beautiful flowers. Elder rowan, there's loads and loads to, to choose one. That one in the, with the big pink berries in the photo there is spindle. You mightn't have be too familiar with spindle. It sort of hides away in hedges. It's not that rare, but we don't see it until it's in berry and we're like, whoa, what is that? It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so there's loads of lovely natives. The key thing with planting a tree is to plant the right tree in the right space so that it's not too big or, you know, that it will suit the, the soils. But I'll show you a book in a minute that, that you can use to get um, guidance. When I'm talking about trees, I always mention ivy. I'm a big fan of ivy. Ivy is a native woodland plant. Um, it's hugely important for pollinators because it flowers late in the season. Um, I keep bees in my garden and you can see that the ivy honey when the bees are relying on, on ivy for um, pollen and, and nectar. Um, it doesn't kill trees, just to point that out. And I think it adds a huge amount to our, our natural landscapes. Obviously, you know, if it's on historic building, it might not be the right um, place for it, but it is a native plant and a huge value for wildlife. I could give a whole talk on ivy, but I won't do that. Just for more information on um, trees or planting trees or choosing trees, the Buds of the Banner is one publication you can get online from Clare County Council. And also the Clare um, Tree Design Guide. I mean, both of those publications will work for pretty much anywhere in the country, but Clare County Council has produced both of those. Both of them you can get um, online. Just an example of a couple of projects. This is in Kilrush. They uh, planted a tree for every, in Clare, uh, planted a tree for every child in the town. Isn't that a fantastic thing? So every, every new, um, I think they based it on kind of on the junior infants or the Ninon Biogas and uh, every year planted a tree. Isn't that brilliant? That was, that came out of um, producing a biodiversity plan for the towns. That's something loads of groups do and I think that came from the gardener in the Vandeleur Gardens because he had seen it I think his home place was Czech and uh, the Czech Republic and he thought of this idea for Kill Russia so that was fabulous. Athen Rye in Galway down the road from me they've planted I think they'll be planting trees on the the outer bypass around the town for about maybe it's about 10 years and they've way over 10,000 trees planted now. Uh, and they worked with the local authority. They got all the permissions they needed. They planted the right tree, they put a lot of research into it and they've thousands and thousands of trees and they involved their community in all the planting for young and old, which is brilliant. Just a plug for native hedging as well. You know, often we go for the, the same old, same old, the grizzlinias and the, you know, yeah, I can't think of the other Leylandis, those kind of things. But actually, a lot of our native shrubs work very nicely in hedging. And I think they could work in urban areas as well. The hawthorns, very hardy, you know, um, and we've lots of other things to choose from as well that look really nice. And, you know, you can manage them as a formal hedge or you can let them go. There's the honeysuckle and the wild rose in that, that photo as well. Um, and just anywhere I go around the country, I just think trees and hedges and shrubs, they just add so much to the urban environment. So I'd really emphasize planting a tree in the right space is a, just a wonderful thing that can really add to, to um, community spaces. It can be a really nice community project as well, you know, getting the community involved. 
And I like this photo, and I can't remember from what part of the country this is. But one thing I would encourage, don't plant flowers under trees, you know, plant them in a separate place. People often love putting flowers under trees. Let the tree sh shine in its own light. Um, trees aren't really meant to have flowers underneath them. They'll, they'll shade them out and they don't really like their roots being messed around with. Just another idea from Ennis and Claire is um, maybe plant a community orchard, lovely community project in a housing estate or in a green space, planting a few fruit trees, get advice. I'm not great on, the, on, on planting fruit trees, I'll be honest, but you know, planting a few apples or plums or even crab apple trees that maybe the community can all share the, the fruits of, they can be involved in the planting great for, for wildlife, you know, because they all flower beautifully. They could be absolutely lovely trees, but wouldn't that be a lovely community project? And Ennis has at least two community orchards and um, one in the housing estate. I just think that's a fantastic idea. Really encourage everybody not to use chemicals. And, um, you know, there's no good reason. I, I often say to people, why? You know, sometimes people, you know, use them because they always have, you know, you really only need to use them where that's absolutely essential. You know, it's bad for the environment, it's really bad for your health, and it's absolutely terrible for wildlife and pollinators. So put it put away those herbicides and really, you know, the only time you need to use herbicides is um or chemicals is for invasive species, you know. Um we have to embrace a sort of a wilder look to our landscapes and to our townscapes and our villages, and you know. Trees with long grass under them isn't that great, you know. Let's let's try and move away from everything being clipped and manicured because it's not good for for you and it's not good for wildlife. I'd also, I mean, I'm kind of speeding through. I'm just watching the clock here, and I don't want to be talking for too long. But you know, mo well, not most, but many towns and villages have a river or a ditch or a canal or a some bit of water somewhere, and. Um, I can't emphasize how much that water is, is, is important for wildlife. Often they can be very neglected spaces, you know, and um, litter or, you know, pipes with runoff going into them. Or sometimes we over manicure where, where it is a feature, we can over manicure it. And we really don't think about water quality enough in this country. Um, and we need to protect water quality for ourselves and for, for wildlife. So, you know, if you've got anywhere watery in your town and village, you know, that is, that can be, think of that, that as one of your biodiversity hotspots. You know, you mightn't be able to see what's in there, but, you know, there's bound to be something living in and around that water or something, birds and bats and insects that depend on, on water. All living things need water, you know. Um, so manage them with nature in mind, you know, very soft touch, you know, not over manicured um, and they can be lovely natural amenities as well and just some examples where you know you have water and they've kind of let the edge grow wild you know because that will protect water quality protect anything running off into that it's a habitat in itself where you let the grass grow long or you protect you know that that riparian or that riverside edge I, I really wouldn't encourage any sort of you know, mowing right to the edge of water or hard landscaping or paving or anything like that. Let, let it go wild and that'll be really good for wildlife. It'll, I think, look lovely and will really protect water quality. And these can be the kind of focal points of our community spaces and lovely places. And I suppose if you're doing all these nice things in your community and you're doing community projects for the benefit of biodiversity and for, and for your community, you know, raise awareness of what you're doing or, or those special places um, that are there or wildlife that are, I think this is a really fantastic thing to do. I mean, I would caution, you know, not to be putting up too many signs, but a well-placed, informative, well-researched sign that tells people about wildlife that is specific to your area. So get advice from your heritage officer or from local experts so that whatever you're putting on the sign is, is very authentic, you know. Um, but that can be a really great way of kind of sharing the love, getting people enthused about their area, realizing what's special or what's, what's there, you know. And I think that can be a really nice thing to do. And, you know, just to finally, just kind of the, the last thing, just, just enjoy those spaces, you know. Go for a kind of a wilder, more sort of, um, 
nature focused approach to, to green spaces and to, to, you know, spaces for nature in your towns and villages and in your community and then enjoy it, share the love, get people involved, you know, and, um, you know, I think you'll find that those spaces really enhance the, the look of a place, they kind of can help build kind of that sort of pride of place and community spirit, getting people involved in those projects and people will be really proud and really enjoy them. That's it. That's uh, all I was going to say for the moment. And I'd really welcome any questions or any thoughts or comments that you, that you might have. So if you want to unmute or if Lorna wants to read out any questions from the chat, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Janice. I mean, that was really, I think, both inspiring and motivating. I think for the people here, I mean, you took us through, you know, auditing your community space, you looked at the planting schemes, the grass management, trees and hedgerows and your watery spaces. So you really gave a holistic view of biodiversity for community spaces. So thank you very much. Um, just looking at the chat there now. Um, okay, let's have a look with some discussion on the name of tidy towns that I'll come back to. Uh, Clonmel Tidy Town said trees on the land is a great way of getting saplings. Be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Be prepared for tiny. So sometimes we keep in our gardens for a year, but mm. it's a cheap way for groups to get lots of native trees and shrubs. And Clonmel again, really early bulbs such as grape hyacinth were recommended to us to plant under trees. They're up and out before the trees have begun to turn green are great for early pollinators. Yes. And that, that's a good point. It's not that no flowers are What I don't like is where people put a flower bed under trees and they're digging them up every year, you know, because that disturbs the tree. And the trees are beautiful, you know, we don't need to enhance them. But I agree, there are some nice bulbs that can look lovely, but you're only planting them once and then they're brilliant. They come back every year. We kind of go a bit mad on the daffodils. I love daffodils. I've got daffodils in my garden, but, you know, let's plant some other bulbs as well. Hyacinths, crocuses, there are other bulbs that will also look absolutely beautiful. And but they actually have something. They have a bit of pollen or nectar that's good for for insects and 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 um, other things. And, you know, so if you if you plant a, a suite of bulbs, you'll have your daffodils, but you'll also have things, they all pop out at different times. So yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for that. And um, lots of people commenting that they really appreciated the, the photographs, Janice. I did as well. I thought it was really good to be able to see examples of what people have done around the country. Um, Patricia is saying our council planted loads of daffodils too. Can we plant something among them now or do we just have to accept what we have? Yeah, well, you know, uh, yeah, and but daff daffodils are lovely. They are lovely, you know, and they do bring a splash of colour. You're probably better, I mean, I'm not an expert on ball planting, I'll be honest, but you could plant among the daffodils something that might just try and look at the timing, you know, or maybe I, I can't give you something right now, but see something that might come out a bit earlier or later. My, in my head, I'm thinking crocuses might come out a little bit earlier, you know, so you might be able to plant something among them or even in another space, you know, embrace the daffodils. They're gonna give you the yellow, but you might be able to plant something else as well, you know. Um. Brilliant, thank you. Um, um, Jeanette just made a comment that Clonmel Apple Fest group have planted over a hundred apple trees along the Stir River. The trees were dedicated to loved ones. Oh, so that's really lovely, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Janice, great presentation. Can you go back over the pollinator options for planters? Yeah, well, I mean, there are options, I suppose. I mean, I don't have a list to hand, but but things like, you know, in, in planters, you can do a mix of things. So if you put, put something, you know, the salvias, you know, where they have the big tall purple spikes or, or lavender or one of those ones that has a big kind of tall and then maybe a Biden's or a Bacopa or one of those ones that will kind of spill out, you know, um, I'm trying to think one's off the top of my head now, you're putting them in the spot, but I would go for a mix, you know, something that's going to be tall and maybe one of the, you know, perennial, something like that. Is it Nemesia? I'm trying to think of the names. No, I'm very bad at names on the spot, but put, put a mix, maybe two or three things. One thing that people often do in planters, they get something, a planter, either the planter is too small or they put too much in it. Go for a few big planters rather than loads and loads of little pots because the watering requirement is just too much. 
So go for, you know, a, a, as, as big a planter as you can fits appropriately in your, your space. And maybe plant three, three or five different things. I always think they look nice in odd numbers, you know, and um, look at kind of contrasting um, color and structure, but something tall and something that'll maybe spill over the side. And you can even include something like ivy, you know, because that'll just look nice. You know, the, you know those um, variegated ivy, something like that. But there is actually, I'm really glad now, I've just remembered, there's a new leaflet, Pollinators for Pots. So if you Google that, it was Galway County Council um, produced that. And it's so hot off the press, I've, I haven't it in my presentation. But if you Google Pots for Pollinators, so that will give you a list of things that will work well in, in a pot as opposed to, you know, out in a big flower bed or something like that. One thing I'd also say, just from my experience around the country, you know, go for peat free um, compost. There's some very good Irish producers of peat free compost. So we, we can't be using peat anymore. We need to protect our bogs because they're holding on to, to carbon. And um, what was it? Oh, yeah. What was the other one? Oh, yeah. Be careful. Think about who's using the space. You know, think about people with mobility or sight issues. So, you know, I have in my travels as an adjudicator found place a bit cluttered, you know, so make sure people can move around, you know, and uh, that you put your planters where they're really adding something rather than detracting or, you know, causing an obstruction. But I think a well-placed planter can be fantastic. So, you know, it can look really good. Brilliant. Thanks, Janice. Uh, I suppose maybe just to, to finish off, and I don't really think this is necessarily something that you can comment on, considering you're, you're an adjudicator in tidy towns, but there was a few comments about perhaps it's time to change the name of tidy towns yeah. to kind of reflect the <laughs> fact that, you know, we don't want to be as tidy. Um, mm -hmm. However, someone also commented that maybe tidy biodiversity towns because it's still important to get the message out about not littering. So yeah, I suppose that's I mean, interesting. Yeah, that was a really good point. We've had endless discussions about this as adjudicators as well. I suppose the thing is, it's a very strong brand. You know, everybody knows what tidy towns is. It's been there, is it 60 years now, you know, so... But I think most tidy towns groups are understand what it, that means and that they understand that there's a lot more to it. It's getting the word out to people who aren't in tidy towns that there's a lot more to it. And it's really focused on the environment and on community. That tidy bit is important. I mean, the litter, unfortunately, we've seen again with people being confined to their two kilometers, not so much in towns or villages, but in large urban spaces, people leaving a lot of litter and it's, it's so bad for the environment. It, it looks so bad. So there is still that litter component and tidy towns group. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just so filled with admiration for tidy towns groups out picking up litter that other people have tossed, you know. I just think they're fantastic. I really do. So the, that litter put, is important. But I agree, there's a lot more to tidy towns than, than tidy. But yeah, it's, it's, it is a strong brand. So it might take a while to, to shift. But maybe it's just spreading the word, you know, and getting you know, people that they understand what, what is involved. And I think if people aren't in a tidy towns group, they should join their local tidy towns group. I just think it's a fantastic movement. I really do. That's brilliant. I think that's a great place to conclude. Uh, I just want to thank Janice so sincerely for coming along, giving up her Saturday afternoon to give this talk to us today and for everyone here who joined us as well. Um, if any of you are, would like a link to this recording, if you would just like to send an email to the museum to educationtph at museum.ie, I've put that in the chat, that's our bookings office, they'll make a note and when the recording is available they'll email you on a link. So have a fantastic weekend everybody and thanks again and take care. Thank you, bye guys. Bye, thank you. Thank you.